to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel the of christ spreading the soul-saving message of and jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ therefore let all the house of israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, and they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Acts chapter 2, verses 36 and 37. Today we're going to be studying about cases of conversion in the Bible. In essence, we're asking the greatest question that's ever been asked. What must I do to be saved? Friend, we hope that you'll tune in as we open our hearts and our minds to the Word of God on this very important subject. As we think today about the gospel plan of salvation and various cases of conversion in the Bible, we specifically look to the book of Acts. And, and you may be wondering, why the book of Acts? Did you know that before the book of Acts, there were no Christians? Many people are confused about that idea. Sometimes they want to turn to maybe even the Old Testament or various books and wonder, how do I become a Christian? Friend, the book of Acts is the book that tells us what must I do to be saved. In fact, Acts 11 verse 26 says they were called Christians first in Antioch. And so as we study these cases of conversion, we're specifically looking to the book of Acts, the book that is all about conversion. As one thinks about conversion and obeying the gospel and becoming a Christian, we need to emphasize and understand why there is such a need. Why does man need to be converted? Why does one need to become a child of God? And friend, I think as we turn to the scripture, we can find evidence that is overwhelming in regards to man's need to obey God's plan of salvation. For example, Man needs the gospel of Jesus Christ and needs to obey it because he can't save himself. In the long ago, the prophet Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 10 verse 23, O Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It's not in man who walks to direct his own steps. I can't choose my own way of salvation. You can't choose your way. Nobody else's way will work except Almighty God's. Proverbs chapter 16 verse 25 says it this way, There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. It's not my way, it's not your way, and friend, in all kindness, it doesn't matter what I think or what you think about salvation. We need to obey the gospel, God's plan of salvation, because we can't save ourselves. And friend, as we think about conversion, let's realize the scripture does affirm that man needs saving. There is something that has caused man to be lost. And we know that that is sin. Sin is the reason we need to obey the gospel and be converted. Do you remember Romans 3 verse 23? How many have sinned? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. When God says all, what does He mean? Well, we understand all, but you know it is defined a little further for us in Romans 3 verse 10. The Bible says, There is none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned, none are righteous, therefore we need to be saved from the consequences of sin. And what are those consequences? The wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. If one lives in sin and dies in sin, that person is sadly going to be lost for eternity and thus the dire need to obey God's plan of salvation. The prophet Ezekiel said in Ezekiel 18 verse 4, The soul who sins shall surely die. And friend, as we think about this great need, why do I need salvation? Why does mankind need salvation? Let's realize that only God's person and God's plan can save us. That individual, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus emphatically said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. 
No man comes to the Father except by me. John 14, 6. This is why the Hebrew writer says Jesus is able to save to the uttermost completely those who come to God through Him. It's God's system, God's plan of salvation that saves. Remember Romans 1.16, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to all those who believe, uh, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. God's plan of salvation, His gospel can save. And of Jesus it was said in Matthew chapter 1, verses 19 through 21, When He came into the world, it was said, You will call His name Jesus. Why? He will save His people from their sins. Friend, as we think today about conversion, we're specifically looking at New Testament accounts of salvation. We're talking about the cases in the Bible. In the New Testament, when people asked, what must I do to be saved? What was the biblical answer to that question? And if that's a pattern for us, must we not also follow their plan of salvation? And so today we begin with the very first case of conversion that ever occurred to Christianity in the New Testament. And that's found in Acts chapter 2. Pentecost. The 3,000 who obeyed the gospel on the day of Pentecost are a prime example for us of what we must do to be saved. What did they have to do that very first time the gospel was preached? Well, how did they respond to that? First of all, they had to hear God's Word. Those on Pentecost were gathered there, multiplied millions gathered, and Peter stands up with the eleven and he preaches Christ to them. Uh, notice Acts chapter 2, verse number 14. What happened on Pentecost? Acts 2 verse 14 says this, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and heed my words. For these people to be saved, they had to hear the Word of God to have true faith and belief in Jesus Christ. And, and that's found throughout the Scriptures. Do you remember Romans 10? Verse number 17, the scripture says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. How do I get faith? By hearing. By hearing what? The Word of God. Only the Word of God can produce true faith in me that leads to salvation. And so when we talk today about obeying the gospel plan of salvation in these cases of conversion, every one of them had to hear the message of salvation from the Word of God. But friend, as we talk about hearing God's Word, what specifically are we talking about? What are the qualities and characteristics of, of someone who correctly hears God's Word? Well, first, hearing the Word of God means that I recognize its authority. God's Word has the final authority on salvation. Let me give you an example. On the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus is there transfigured before His disciples and Peter makes the statement, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let's make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And the voice of God came down from heaven and said, This, Jesus, is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. Hear ye Him. When we talk about hearing the Word of God, we're recognizing that God's voice is the final authority. It has the final say on matters of salvation. And my friend, the Scripture does teach that specifically. Matthew 28, verse 18, Jesus said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And then He said, Go and make disciples of all nations. Whatever you do in word or deed, we're to do in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. John 12 verse 48 teaches us why. Because it's those words, the words of Christ, are going to be my judge. Jesus said, He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. And so friend, listen carefully. As we talk today, about obeying the gospel, these cases of conversion, and specifically hearing the Word of God. It doesn't matter what popular opinion says. It doesn't matter what some, quote, pastor somewhere says or, or some religious leader somewhere says. The only thing I'm accountable for and you're accountable for as it relates to God is His Word. All else 
is inconsequential concerning salvation. And so we must put our hope and trust in the authority of God's Word. Secondly, hearing God's Word means that I'm going to do my homework, that I'm going to check and make sure that what I've heard is true to the Word of God. Uh, imagine the scene. Acts chapter 17, verse 11. The Bible says of the Bereans, these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, they received the Word of God with all readiness, and searched the Scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Envision the scene in your mind. The Apostle Paul comes to the area of Berea. Paul knocks on the door. He says, I've changed my ways. I'm here to tell you about Jesus. I want to tell you about salvation in Christ. What those Bereans do? They received the word with all readiness. They said, Paul, come in. Sit down. Tell us, tell us what you're talking about. Paul came in. They sat down together. Paul began to tell them about Christ. Tell them about the message of salvation. Tell them about his conversion. And when he was through with that, what did they do? Did they automatically accept it? They said, Paul, we've heard what you had to say. We've written it down. Then they searched the Scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Friend, the good and honest heart is the one who hears the message with readiness. When someone preaches the gospel, we're ready to hear that. That, that potentially could be the voice from God, God's message through that person. So we're ready to hear it, but we're not going to obey it until we've checked it and we've made sure it is God's Word, not man's Word. This is why the Scripture says, Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 21. This is why John said, Test the spirits to see whether they are of God. Why, John? For many false prophets have gone out into the world. And this is why it's so important to study, to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed. Friend, listen carefully. When you hear the message that's being preached, when you hear anyone stand up and preach and they say, I've got a message from God or this is what God says, check it in your own Bible and be sure. Lots of folks have been duped and deceived into believing a lie when they had the Bible right in their own hand. All they had to do was check it in the Scripture. And that's all we ask. That's all God asks of you. Check your Bible and see, is this really the Word of God that we're hearing? And then, friend, when we think about hearing the Word of God, it means that if it is God's Word, and we've checked that. My responsibility to that message and your responsibility to that message is to listen very carefully to what God says. Luke 8, 18 says, Take heed how you hear. Are we listening with an ear toward eternity? Take heed who you hear. Mark chapter 4, verse 24, what we hear. All those things are essential. And as Jesus said in every one of the letters to the seven churches in Asia Minor, He that has ears to hear, let him hear. Revelation 2 and 3. And so the day of Pentecost, they had to hear the message of God to be saved. But you know, as we think about Acts chapter 2 and that great sermon, there are so many things specifically that Peter outlines for them that they had to hear. What did they have to know as it related to salvation? They had to know from the Scripture that Jesus was proven to be the Son of God. Notice Acts chapter 2, verses 16 through 21. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. It shall come to pass in those last days, says God, that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall see dreams. On my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my Spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. I'll show wonders in heaven above, signs in earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor and smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord and it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Peter is talking about the events that have just happened. The Holy Spirit coming upon these disciples. They being able to speak in unknown languages without ever having studied them. And he says this is what the prophet said proving Christ is the Son of God because these things are happening. And thus as we think about what do I need to know to be saved? I need to know. I've looked at the proof. Jesus truly is the Son of God. 
prophecy over and over again confirms that. You can look in Isaiah 53 and every one of the details of that suffering servant is fulfilled in Jesus. You can read in Psalm 22 about what was going to happen on the cross and, and Christ fulfilled that perfectly. You can look all the way back to Genesis 3.15 where the, the seed of woman would crush the head of Satan and Jesus again fulfills that perfectly. I see the proof in the Bible just as they did from Scripture that Jesus is the Son of God. And then when I turn to Acts chapter 2, not only do I see the proof from Scripture that Jesus is the Christ, God Himself affirms and proves this through miracles. Look in Acts chapter 2 and I want you to notice verse number 22. The men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested or approved by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst as you yourselves also know. How can I be sure Jesus is the Christ? God, through miracles, signs, and wonders, proved that. What do we mean? Think about some of the miracles Jesus did. Jesus took a, a few pieces of fish and a few loaves of bread and fed 5,000 people and they took up 12 baskets of fragments. How did He do that? That's God from heaven saying, this is my, the Messiah, this is my Son. Think about the wonders that occurred. For example, when Jesus got out of the boat or Jesus is out in the water and they're coming to Him on the boat and they see Jesus and He's walking on water. Who can walk on water? That's just not physically possible. An amazing wonder. What was the purpose of that? To show this is my Son. This is the Savior of the world. When you think about signs from heaven, for example, think about at the baptism of Jesus when John baptizes Christ and that voice from heaven approves of that. This is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. That sign from heaven was pointing to Christ as the Son of God. And the miracles surely prove Jesus is God's Son. And you know, as you look through the chapter, you see the, the plan of redemption proving this. In verse 23, God's whole scheme of redemption was pointing toward Jesus Christ. You have the, the resurrection brought into that in verses 24 through 28. The fact that Christ was raised from the dead, that, that death could not contain Him. The empty tomb. Peter, in essence, says is proof of Christ as the Messiah. And then he draws up one of the great prophets, David himself. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. And Peter says, David's long gone and buried. Who's he talking about? David affirmed Christ was the seed who was going to reign on his throne and who's going to be king of kings and Lord of lords. Revelation chapter 19, verse number 16. And then we turn to that key verse that really is the climax of, climax of everything these people need to hear. Acts 2 verse 36, Therefore, in view of this overwhelming proof, therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly, God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and and Christ. In essence, Peter said, God has proved it to you, that one you just killed, He's your Lord and He's your Christ. In view of that evidence, as they saw the evidence, as they heard those words, as it made an impact on their heart and mind, these people made the proper response to God's message. Notice Acts 2, verse number 37. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? The evidence mounted up. They could not deny it. Their heart is uh, opening up to that word and they're feeling that in the heart. They know it's truth. What shall we do? What a great response to that message. They believed what Peter was saying is true. And friend, to be saved, you've got to believe in Jesus. You've got to look at the evidence and believe He is the Son of God. John 8 verse 24, Jesus said, Unless you believe that I am He, you'll surely die in your sins. You can't be saved without commitment and belief to Jesus Christ. But friend, listen ever so carefully. Many people teach this. Many men and false teachers teach this. But the Bible doesn't. The Bible doesn't teach belief alone saves. In fact, the only time faith and only occur in your Bible 
it says the exact opposite. Did you know that? James 2 verse 24, James said, We see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. How are we justified? Not by faith alone. The Scripture specifically says that. And so just as in this context, and just as in every account you see, they ask, what must we do? They believe in Jesus and they say, what must we do? And details are given for exactly what they must do. Matthew 7 verse 21, Jesus taught something must be done. Jesus said, it's not everybody. Looks up into heaven and says, Lord, Lord, that's going there. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Well, what specifically were they told to do? Acts chapter 2, verse number 38. Peter said, Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. These people who have just realized they killed their own Messiah and are looking for an escape from that sin are told to repent to be saved. Peter clearly said that. And friend, as you look throughout the New Testament, that's something that Jesus overwhelmingly taught. Luke chapter 13, verse number 3 and verse number 5. Jesus said, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Acts 3 verse 19, they're told to repent and turn again that their sins might be blotted out. And when we talk about repentance, yeah, they were sorry for sin. They realized what they did wrong, but they wanted also to turn from that. And that's the idea of repentance. Repentance isn't just saying I'm sorry and going back and doing the same thing. Repentance is a changed way of thinking that leads to a changed way of acting according to the will of God. Did these people have to confess Jesus? By the very fact that they, when they responded to Peter's message and said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? They recognize, you're right. He is the Christ. He is the Messiah. What do we need to do to get right with God? Their very response was an acknowledgement of who Jesus Himself was. And friend, the Scripture confirms, as well as Jesus Christ, that we must confess Christ. Romans 10 verse 10 and Matthew 10 verses 32 and 33. But then, what else did Peter say in Acts chapter 2 verse 38? Look at it again. Peter said, Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Friend, I want you to listen real carefully because we're talking about hearing the Word of God. We're talking about not what men says, what, what, not what men say, what does the Bible say? Repent and be baptized. Why, Peter? For the remission of sins. For in the Bible teaches, if it's sin that separates us from God, and it is, Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2, the Bible teaches, and we just heard it from the mouth of God, men must be baptized for their sins to be remitted. Remitted means removed, wiped away, where they're not be held against us anymore. When you think about baptism in the New Testament, over and over again, we hear the words about baptism being essential to salvation. Let me give you two or three examples. Mark chapter 16, verse number 16. Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Jesus did not say, He that believes will be baptized. Jesus did not say, He that bapti uh, is baptized, He that believes will be saved. He that's baptized will be saved. Rather, Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Both are absolutely essential to salvation. Listen to the words of Jesus in John chapter 3, verse number 5. Jesus said, Assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Must one be baptized to be saved, to get into God's kingdom, to have his sins washed away? Let's think about another example who we can learn from as it relates to baptism. Acts chapter 9, verse 6, Paul asked the Lord, Lord, what would you have me to do? What was God's answer to him? Paul recounts his own conversion. In Acts chapter 22 and verse number 16, Ananias comes to Saul and says, Saul, Saul, why are you tearing? Why are you waiting? Arise, get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. You know, we heard the words ourselves in Acts 2 verse 21. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How do you call on the name of the Lord? Arise, be baptized, wash away your sins, having called on the name of the Lord. 
Friend, does the Bible teach to be converted, to become a Christian, to have your sins washed away, and to be saved? You must be baptized? Absolutely. You know, if we were going to say it as clearly as we could, we could not improve upon the words of 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 21. Listen to the clarity of this language. Peter says, Baptism does now also save us. Question, does the Bible say, does God say, baptism saves us? We just heard it. 1 Peter 3 verse 21. If God says that, then friend, to be converted, to obey the gospel, I've got to submit to that. And so today as we think about this case of conversion, they heard God's message. They, they believed in Jesus. They were willing to change their lives. They acknowledged Jesus as the Christ and they submitted to God's plan of salvation. And friend, we're pleading with you today. If you haven't obeyed the gospel, become a Christian. Be converted before it's everlastingly too late. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.